Hey guys, what's up? John here from flyatmikealpha.com and today we're going to be going over the risk assessment matrix and a couple different ways of how to assess risk associated with your flying. So something really important to be thinking about once you're in that private pilot certificate and you move on from there, you should really be familiar with single pilot resource management and the risk assessment matrix to help you decide whether or not some of the risk that you're taking on is acceptable or not. So hopefully your CFI has gone over this with you, at least at some point in your flying career, and talked to you about the risk assessment matrix that the FAA has come out with. It's this fun little chart here that shows us all these different little green, yellow, and red areas that basically tells us if it's acceptable, acceptable risk with mitigation, or unacceptable risk. So let's go ahead and talk about what all this means. Well, at the top here we have minimal, minor, major, hazardous, and catastrophic. So the FA went ahead and defined those for us in case you're not familiar. And you can kind of take a look along here. We're not going to go into all these, but obviously minimal being negligible safety effects. So it's really not a concern to us. It's totally fine to go do. And catastrophic being that there's going to be multiple fatalities or fatality to all on board, usually with the loss of the aircraft or the vehicle. So that would be something like a spin into the ground uh, from low altitude where the airplane gets destroyed on impact. So let's come down here and go ahead and apply a few of these and see how it looks. So for starters, let's go ahead and define the acceptable risk, acceptable risk with mitigation and unacceptable risk in our green, yellow, and red quadrants here. So acceptable risk is, yeah, sure, let's go ahead and do it. Let's go fly the airplane uh, because we deem that to be acceptable. Obviously, flying is not the safest thing out there. It, there is risk associated with it, so we're going to have to accept some form of risk. Yellow means... It's an acceptable risk, but we should really try to mitigate it somehow, or it's acceptable, but we're going to have to do something else to mitigate it to try to bump it back into this green area. And of course, red is just don't do it. It's not a good idea. It's really, really bad. And if we find a risk at some point during our pre-flight planning or throughout our flying while we're in flight, and it falls into the yellow or red area, that's not you know the end of the world. You're not going to die right away. But you do need to do some things to try to move that back into a green area. So you may have to take some sort of action uh, to move that back in the green area. And we'll give you some examples here because all this sounds really fancy and fantastic, but without any real world examples, it's all just kind of theory and useless and doesn't really do you any good. So let's take an example here of, you know, you're doing a pre-flight and you see some oil on the ground underneath the cowling. You, you flew the airplane in, you parked it, you went in and grabbed lunch at the FBO, you came back out, and there's a, a six-inch wide uh, little oil spot underneath the uh, airplane there. So what does that mean to us? Well, that means to us that there's an oil leak in the engine. That could potentially be a major hazardous or even catastrophic issue if we were to go ahead and fly with an airplane engine that's leaking that much oil in that short of time. And what's the likelihood that it's going to occur? Well, if it's already leaking oil now, it's pretty likely it's going to continue to do so in flight. So it's probable to frequent. And so that lands you somewhere up here in the yellow to red area. So now what do you do? Well, you mitigate it so you can still go fly. How do you mitigate it? Well, you may decide to uh, go ahead, look in the maintenance log books, pop the cowling, look at the oil level, and first thing I might do is just look at the oil level and I walk up to this 172 that's got this oil underneath it and some oil slicked down the belly and I pull out the dipstick and it says seven and a half quarts and so I go ahead and I find an A&P and I talk to that A&P and throughout talking to him he is able to bestow upon me some knowledge about Lycoming O360 engines that although they say to fill them up to eight quarts when you get the oil changed it typically just dumps that right out the belly as soon as you go fly the airplane. Uh, generally ends up settling down somewhere around six to seven quarts. So when I look in the maintenance logs, I find out that the oil was changed yesterday. And so I now decide, well, hey, the rest of the engine looks fine. And it pumped out some oil, which is to be expected. And so that risk has now been mitigated to, well, what's the hazard? It's now pretty much minimal or minor. And the likelihood that's going to occur dumping oil and then level off at some, some safe area well, it's going to wind me up somewhere in the green here because it's going to continue to dump oil, be probable or frequent, but then it's going to it's going to be extremely improbable that's going to continue to spew oil from the engine, and so it's going to land me somewhere down this nice safe area here. Another example might be uh, you go ahead and you uh, 
you know, you do your pre-flight and everything looks great. And so we hop in the airplane. And what kind of risk are we taking on? Well, let's say what kind of risk is associated with the engine just, you know, having an uncontained failure and exploding off the front of the airplane? Well, that would be catastrophic. If the engine comes off the airplane or breaks into a bunch of different pieces, it's going to have be a weight and balance issue, and it's going to be a lot of other issues associated with that. It's going to be catastrophic. Now, what's the likelihood of that happening? If your pre-flight looked good and you've been flying the airplane, there's no history of issues with this airplane? Well, it's extremely improbable. Engines don't just spontaneously explode unless they have that AD on them from the new light combing engines. Uh, so... It's a catastrophic issue, but it's extremely improbable. So it lands you somewhere down around here in this red to yellow area. And you see this little asterisk here, and it says, unacceptable with a single point or common cause failures. So the engine exploding on us is not a common cause failure. It's, it's a rare failure, and it bumps it down to this yellow area, which is acceptable risk with mitigation. All right, so how do we mitigate this risk that we take on every single time we go fly an airplane of the engine just spontaneously exploding? It does happen. It's extremely improbable, but it would be catastrophic. So how do we mitigate from the yellow and get ourselves back into a green happy area? Well, it's simple. You kind of just follow the FARs, right? We have those all those recommendations about safe altitudes to fly. We pick a route that gives us good obstacle clearance, that gives us good options to make emergency landings. We make sure that we're getting good maintenance done on the airplane. We're doing a proper pre-flight. We're squawking any issues with the airplane. It's regularly going through its inspections, having oil analysis done, cutting open the oil filter every time you have the engine serviced, those sorts of things. So if you're doing all that to mitigate that risk and flying high above those obstacles, always flying at an altitude that puts you in a position where you could glide to an airport or a place where you could land without undue hazard to persons or property on the ground, as the FAA likes to say, then you're winding up somewhere back into an acceptable risk area, which is fine. We take on that risk every time we go flying. So you can kind of see how we're going here as far as how we're using this matrix and whether or not we want to go or not go. Another example I'd like to give you would be getting into an airplane that's brand new. You know, so you got a brand new shiny airplane. It's only got like 15, 20 hours on it. So there's a number of different things that can go wrong with a brand new airplane. Don't know what's tight, what's loose, what might work its way loose, uh, what if the engine's broken in properly, all sorts of different things. So there's a number of hazardous to catastrophic things that could happen with that airplane. And the likelihood of them happening with the airplane with 15 or 20 hours is probably remote, but, you know, somewhere between remote and extremely remote. But it still lands you in a yellow to red area. So what do you do to mitigate this risk? Well, sometimes there's just not a way to mitigate risk. It's a brand new airplane. Obviously, you do a proper pre-flight. You make sure that the guys that were assembling it were doing it on a uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, because on Fridays they hurry out of the shop, and on Mondays they come in hungover. Um, that sort of thing. You never want to buy a car that was built on a Monday or a Friday. So besides that, now we still have this risk that we're taking on. So what else do you do? Well, if you're a low-time pilot, don't go fly the airplane. Find somebody that's a little more experienced to put some time on it to build it up. Someone that's really experienced with those types of airplanes to go build time on the engine and prove that airframe before they hand it over to you. So you're taking an airplane maybe with 100 or 200 hours on it. And now you still have some issues that could go wrong, some major hazardous catastrophic issues, but they all fall down to the extremely improbable range because the airplane's proven itself over a few hundred hours, had a few inspections since then, and everything's been looking okay. So there's not always a way to move out of this area. It just means that if you're in this area, you really want to think about, are you the guy to go fly the airplane? No, I know. I'm going to use good judgment. I haven't... You know, is it really your day to go fly? Maybe you want to go find somebody else to fly that day. Another example might be thunderstorms along the route of flight. So that's major hazardous. Could be catastrophic if you get into the wrong area. And if they're along your route of flight, the possibility of you encountering them gets into the remote to probable range, depending on how much you're willing to deviate around them and how good your weather planning skills really are. So that bumps you into a red to yellow area here. How do we mitigate against that? Well, easy question, uh, easy answer to that would be just don't go fly. Wait a few hours, delay the flight until the thunderstorms die out. Could be to uh, have some onboard weather radar. Maybe take an aircraft that has onboard weather radar or next rad fed to it. Talk to ATC, get pilot reports, see what's going on out there, and mitigate that risk down to your light. Although they're out there, you know, and it's very 
it's known, it's not probable, it's absolutely known that there are thunderstorms along your route of flight, it's less likely that you're going to encounter them because you're going to do some proper pre-flight planning, put some extra fuel on the airplane, and deviate around them, and maybe you're instrument rated. So that also helps decrease uh, the likelihood of encountering them because you're not going to just go blindly fly into IMC and get turned around and fly into an embedded thunderstorm. You're an experienced IFR pilot, knows weather planning, and can handle that sort of situation. If you're a VFR pilot, that makes it slightly more hazardous to you and continues to bump you up into the yellow and red areas. Again, a good way to mitigate that is either be more experienced, have better equipment on the airplane, use single pilot resource management or CRM with other people on board to help you deviate around that weather, help you plan the flight, if you have other pilots that you're flying with, or just simply wait a bit till those thunderstorms go away, and then your likelihood of encountering any becomes extremely remote to extremely improbable. One last example here, let's say you go ahead and decide to bring a, uh, a young kid flying with you. Maybe you volunteer at EA Young Eagles, you want to give somebody an experience of flying an airplane. It's a great, awesome thing to do with your time and with your aircraft. So let's say you bring along a uh, 10-year-old kid flying with you. Well, the risk of them misbehaving, grabbing hold of the controls at a critical phase like takeoff or landing, or uh, causing an issue for you, flipping switches, turning the fuel valve off on you. If anything like that were to happen, it could be anywhere from minor to major, maybe hazardous even. Um, you know, Some of those 10-year-old kids are pretty strong and don't know their own strength. They're fighting with you on the controls. And what's the likelihood of this happening? Well, depending on how much sugar that child has had this morning, it could be anywhere from extremely remote to remote towards even probable if they're anything like leave it to beaver. So if they fall into that category, how do you mitigate out of that yellow and red lines there or those yellow and red boxes? Well, bring another adult with you. Put the kid in the back seat away from the controls. Belt them in. Uh, have you know the kids sit up front so they might be able to fly a little bit but have another adult in the back seat so that they can uh, make sure the kid behaves themselves while you're flying in critical phases of flight. That bumps you down to the green. Also, give them a good briefing. Explain to them what the controls do, what all the buttons and switches do. Take your time with them and explain to them the importance of keeping their hands in their lap and not touching anything when you are busy flying the airplane. So pre-flight briefings, extra people on board, any number of ways, that's all your resource management, your aeronautical decision-making skills, all that coming into play to help bring you down to this green area that's nice and happy and safe. So hopefully that gives you a good idea of how to apply the risk assessment matrix, especially if you've never seen it before. Try to use it when you're doing some pre-flight planning, even a day or two in front of your flight to try to identify some risks and see if any of those risks are leading you to a very dangerous area. Make sure you're familiar with this when you go for your check rides. The FAA examiner may ask you some questions about it, and they want to know that you're able to use this to be making good decisions as a pilot. If you have any questions about this or have any scenarios that you've used this and you'd like to share, leave them in the comments below. We'd be happy to talk about them. Make sure you give us a thumbs up on our video. Subscribe to our channel. Keep up with our latest videos. Check out our website and our Patreon page. We really appreciate all your support. Make sure you share us with your friends and family on Facebook and all your friends around the airport. As always, if you can't fly every day, then fly at MikeAlpha.com. We'll see you all next time.